My dad's one of five. Two of his brothers and his father uh, are pilots. He has one sister, and she's married to Ricardo, who's also a pilot. Here she is with her four kids. Ricardo, 25 years ago, had to move away from Venezuela. And in fact, it's not in the picture because he was flying. The logo you see at the bottom is the Venezuelan airline logo. And he went to fly for an Asian airline. His dream was to retire in Margarita Island, just off the coast of Venezuela, and uh, spend time with his family after what he thought would be a period of about 25 years, which happened to be 2020. In March 2020, he finally got to that point, and he was not allowed to leave the country to go back and be with his family. He had to wait nine months. Finally, in December, he got home to spend time with Titina, as I called my auntie, and the four kids. Now, um, from December through April, it was all joy, it was all reunion, it was all constancy of presence. Unfortunately, he contracted COVID, he became ill, and he passed away in April. And that's part of the story of us. This last year has brought about big T trauma and small T trauma. Big T trauma in terms of, for instance, the deaths of loved ones, like my uncle, who is more importantly a husband and a father and a friend to many. I'm sure for many of you that was a reality. Over three and a half million lives have been lost and small T trauma in terms of all the changes that, that we've had to continuously manage and adapt to. As we look at the data in healthcare, and this is something that you know well, I'm just giving you one example from Chris Van Hacht in Belgium, who canvassed thousands of people across the country. And you can see here personal, physical, and psychological reactions. And the writing is small, but what you see there is a difference between the pre-COVID state and the intra-COVID state. Every couple of months, they take the temperature of these few thousand people and, uh, and what, what we see there very clearly is uh, that things are getting worse from a physical perspective, from a psychological perspective, and so on. It's been a tough year. When we canvassed about 800 people in Colombia using a burnout inventory, we were shocked by the results, which we just gathered uh, last Friday. Th this, this is a percentage of people that showed signs of burnout, 99.8%. There was one responder who didn't. Uh, I appreciate the time you took to um, go through the survey, and we're going to see that in a second. This is The Guardian from a couple of days ago, and this is the BMJ from a couple of weeks ago. It's not just the risk that is present, uh, but also uh, some of the uh, emerging um, behaviors that we're seeing towards healthcare staff that put us in a state of vulnerability. So what I'm inviting you to do over the next half an hour it's just to reflect on you as an N of one, as an N of one. So first I'm gonna talk about teams and then I'm gonna focus the majority of the time on you as an N of one. So here's the, here's the result of your, of your um, service, the ones you took the time to take at the beginning of this presentation. Martin, if you can help me put those up. So this is a, a, a fantastic group and what I'm focusing on here is the space to the right to the right of the slide, the space of opportunity. Uh, there will always be space for opportunity in terms of well-being. This is a, a, a pretty simple uh, scale for personal well-being that you can download at any point. Uh, thank you for contributing to it. The space towards the right if what, is what I want to focus on today. And then the next slide, which was a quick Mayo Clinic burnout inventory, uh, where 80% of you said yes to at least one of these uh, statements. Uh, and what that means is that there might be something for you to explore deeper. Uh, again, thank you for participating. I just wanted to overemphasize the point of the state that we're in right now. As I say that, I also speak on behalf of the Health Improvement Alliance Europe as we move on to our sixth year and as we dedicated a lot of time during our fifth year together in learning, uh, we heard many stories. We saw the commitment of the King's Fund, uh, Susie Bailey, Michael West, Compassion, uh, Imperial, Bob Claver and his team, Kindness, and Lara, who spoke this morning about taking care 
of staff, the Scottish Government, NHS England, NHS Improvement, many of our members came with clear stories of their commitment to well-being. Royal Free, who you heard from yesterday in terms of the reduction of uh, turnover in ICU at Barnet, uh, have dedicated a lot of time to what I think are two fundamental questions. One is what matters to you, meaning what matters to staff. And number two, what are the pebbles in your shoes? And not just ask the question, but actually act upon it uh, and provide in a state of co-production, in a state of co-design solutions that are sustainable. In the same vein, I spoke to Tanya, who's the Director of Human Resources at East London Foundation Trust, and she told me three beautiful stories. Sunshine in my pocket, vitamin D during winter for all staff. Secondly, providing education for young kids for seven weeks during the pandemic for all staff to access. Over 1,500 lessons were taken. And thirdly, an effort they're undertaking with menopause to ensure that facilities, that setup and so on is appropriate. This is asking what matters to you. This is asking what are the pebbles in your shoes and this is acting upon it. I could go on and on with uh, examples, as you know, the IHI has been working with a framework of joint work for many years now. This is the framework. Uh, from the framework, there's a couple of papers. One, the original joint work paper, and number two, a conversation guide that we developed rapidly during COVID. From the work of that um, content area, we have developed a network, and that network is moving into its second year, and we've got many examples from across the world. I'm just going to invite you to take a plane with me to Brazil briefly and go to the city of Libanese hospital where they talk about alegria. Alegria means joy, but they're working on psychological safety, they're working on physical safety, they're working on communication. This is Vania at the center of the picture and this is part of the alegria team at the city of Libanese hospital. You've probably seen a version of this where people at the end of each shift talk about uh, describing whether it's been a collaborative and, and participatory shift, and this is connected to the participatory management aspect of the joint work framework, or if it's been a non-collaborative and non-participatory uh, shift. And depending on the responses that they get in real time, they have learning conversations to address those. Part of the result is this, uh, an increase in people agreeing with a statement, I participate in local decisions that affect my work, which is something that, as uh, Mark reminded us this morning, is paramount to the future uh, and the sustainability, sustainability of health and healthcare. The second thing, and you'll hear from Amy in the afternoon about psychological safety that they've done, which I love actually, is the Atlas Code. They've actually given uh, a brand to the opportunity to raise the volume and have direct lines of being able to address things in real time when things um, happen that are a threat to them, when there's disrespect, when there's aggressive language, when there's har harassment and when there's unsafe actions. That's what the ATLAS acronym stands for. Again, they've uh, developed it with staff, they're testing solutions and they're measuring the impact of that. It's not just healthcare though. Let's look at the world around us. There are things that are happening which, from a small T trauma, are pretty big, actually, because we cannot disconnect ourselves from our humanity. When you look at the UN report that was published in December, you look at the environment and the planetary imbalances. When we look at uh, COVID and what's happened with inequities, uh, we understand the social imbalances that have always been there, that have always been there. They just have an accent over them. And when you look at what's ahead, Take a look at the graph top right at the human development index and the, and the prediction, and the prediction. That's a variation over time, those green bars. And look at the prediction here. Significant decrease on human development index. And look at the bottom graph, which is hunger, hunger around the world. Look at the predicted increases in three scenarios. So the, the world around us is also putting pressure on us directly and indirectly uh, to make sure that we are ever present in taking care of ourselves. This is not something that should be an add-on to our lives. This should be core to our lives. The impact of the pandemic will continue to live on. And we, as a healthcare community, should be working individually and together to address this. Um, I want to ensure that I don't forget to mention technology. It's, it's beautiful. It's doing amazing things for us. In fact, much of the care that happened non-COVID during the pandemic was virtual. 
In fact, you're probably tweeting right now. In fact, you probably get a lot of your information from your phone. However, this eternal hunger and this uh, clever invention of infinite scrolling is leading to hypervigilance. So we feel wired constantly to distraction and most importantly to absence. I personally think this is a time to be present. This is a time to ensure that we're authoring our own biographies, that we're authoring our own biographies, that we are not moving through inertia to the next normal, that we're shaping that next normal actively. And I know you are individually, and I hope we are together as a community now and into the future. But in order to do that, we need to be present. We need to take care of ourselves uh, and just to provoke you. Uh, the next time you find yourself responding to the question, how are you? I'm busy. Just think about the effect that that's having on the other person and think about the reality that that means for you. If that's all you can say when you're being asked, how are you? It's commonplace. I'm going to rescue something from v Viktor Frankl before I move into the detail of the how, I suppose, in a very personal way. Stimulus and response. In that space between stimulus and response, there's an opportunity. And it's in that space of opportunity and possibility that I want to explore with you some thoughts. Uh, in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. The opportunity that the pandemic is affording us right now is to shape the next normal, to grow, and to use our freedom to be present, to be present deal with some of the pressures and enjoy some of the opportunities that we have to shape an ever improving future. So I'm going to go straight to your well-being through my story. Um, so I'm going to get uh, quite intimate. And I'm not going to talk about work-life balance. I've never really understood why we differentiate that as if work somehow was outside of our lives. Work is our life. How much time do you spend at work? I think we need to develop continuously the well-being muscle. I think we need to appreciate, value, and celebrate the power of one. Each of you as individuals has an effect on other people. Us as a community, we have an effect on our communities uh, around. And I think we can commit not just to ourselves, but to each other. I'm inviting you to give yourself and those around you the gift of well-being. And there are three things at a very high level that I, that I want you to consider. One is being intentional. One is being intentional. This is not going to happen through inertia. Secondly, share it, at least with one person. Whatever you're doing, share it. And third, uh, never stop learning. Learn, improve, repeat. Well-being is a dynamic endeavor. As you self-assess, we did a couple of questionnaires this morning just to provoke a reflection. But as we self-assess, I want to invite you to consider the analogy of our cars. If you drive, many of us are driving less and less, thankfully. If you do drive, uh, you're probably not inclined to ignore the signals from the car. When a light goes on, you pay attention. When a light goes on, you probably move into action. And unfortunately, we stopped because we're so busy. We stopped listening to our bodies. In my case, during the first six months of the pandemic, I felt hypervigilant. I wanted to check the news regularly. I wanted to feel efficacious by calling our partners, calling our friends from work, calling families around the world that I have had relationships with to ensure that we were connected, that we were helping each other, that we were trying to add to some of the solutions that were possible during the pandemic. That hypervigilance for me resulted in poor sleep that affected a number of things in my life. And I found myself as well eating anxiously. So I decided to take action and be proactive about some of the patterns that I was identifying about some of the lights that were turning on in my system. I've just added some more of those lights. If you're experiencing any of those, just check in with yourself. Just look in the mirror and think about what could be uh, the causes of that. Well-being, I won't define it uh, letter by letter. Uh, as Fee introduced me, I was reminded of a paper that I reviewed on BMJ recently from about 12 years ago, where she took a stab at defining well-being. This is, for me, less today about defining well-being, but rather about understanding it as a dynamic phenomenon, a dynamic phenomenon. Last night, I didn't sleep well. I hadn't slept out of my bed for about a year. So I'm probably, it was probably special cause variation, but most of the time 
we, we understand that this is a dynamic endeavor, a dynamic phenomenon, well-being. And as such, I want to invite you to try to use improvement methods uh, as a mechanism to address some of the opportunities. And I'm going to invite you, as Walter invited me, to try to make the tiramisu that he makes. Walter owns a B&B in the Amalfi Coast. I'm not going to advertise it by name, nor city. This is Walter and Luca, his son. As I went to spend some time with him, I said to Walter, Walter, I love your tiramisu. Can you, can you teach me to make it? And he said, sure. And he grabbed my hand and he dragged me to the kitchen. I brought a napkin and a pen. And I thought I was going to write a perfect recipe, letter by letter, timed, perfectly measured. And what he did was he took out the core ingredients, some flour, some eggs, some cinnamon, some coffee, and on and on and on. He put them on the table and he started mixing them by, by eye by ear, by instinct. And every time I asked him a question of precision, he would go back and say, but just look at the texture. Just feel the, feel the texture. Just look at the smell, and so on. And I wasn't understanding. Uh, and I understood at the end of that conversation that that's Walter's tiramisu, which is going to be different from any other that I try anywhere. There are some core ingredients, but the mix and the method is very much his. And that resembles a lot of the improvement work that we do. And this is the kind of invitation I'm making to you, that we invite each other to cook the tiramisu of well-being together, but that you make your own, that you mix your own ingredients in a way that's amenable to you. And if I was to give you another analogy, it's this one. Let's imagine that we're all sitting in a room. We all have a piece of paper. We're sharing the crayons. And I'm just going to paint a picture while you observe. Or you can paint your own picture at home. So this is what the picture looks like for me. So let's imagine that we can be very intentional about well-being and set an aim. That aim should have a how much and by when about improving our well-being. And then there's going to be some drivers. In my case, and I'm sharing my personal story and some of the intimacy behind that, I have five primary drivers that I identified when I self-assessed why I was experiencing some of the symptoms that I experienced. Uh, one is to ensure that I'm physically active, to get moving. Secondly, is to nurture relationship, see, see more of the people that I love, uh, feed the soul, meaning do things that are enjoyable. Uh, fourthly, not let technology take over, but rather control technology. And fifth, uh, eat and sleep better. And for all of those, or for some of those, uh, I try to track some things. And I try to use them all for improvement so that I PDSA my way into changing patterns of behavior. This is Mango, my dog, golden retriever. And this is the towpath in Belfast. It runs from Belfast through to Lisburn and beyond. That's about 10 miles, possibly. And when I run there, uh, which is often, I see Gary. Gary is usually riding his bike. So I was curious. And I asked him about a month and a half ago, um, when he was asking me to give him a, a, a doggy poo bag to put in one of his bags, I said, hey, Gary, I'm interested in your story. I love what you do. I think you create social value. I, I think it's brilliant. Tell me more about you. Gary was a gardener. He has a passion for nature. He has a passion for outdoors. He has a passion for the environment. And uh, he started as a gardener developing some challenges with his knees. Uh, it became impossible to do his job as a gardener well enough, and he started to become depressed. And Gary started to drink more than he wanted to. And one day he decided to just leave gardening and supplement some of his time with volunteering activities. The volunteering activity that he has is seven days a week for three hours in the morning. He cleans up the path. He's on his bike. Every single day, for those of you that are in Belfast, if you see Gary, please say hi. He has the Tesco's bag where he puts the doggy bags. He asks people, can I take that off you so that they don't throw it anywhere? And then behind the bike, he has this, where he has a hook in case he sees anything in the water, where he has wipes in case anybody uh, sprays uh, the, the bench that you see behind them. He has a, a, a pickup tool so that he picks up things that people uh, don't put in the, in, the, in, the, in the bin. He gets moving. For him, well-being, it's about feeding the soul by connecting with nature, but about moving. And this is not new. The evidence is very black and white around uh, physical movement and well-being, not just from the literature, but from beautiful uh, experiences such as the Blue Zones. If you haven't seen <laughs> these longevity hotspots, please go and visit not the, the hotspots, which you should, especially the ones in, uh, in, in tropical areas, but uh, the website. 
so that you see some of the changes. Fundamental to this is moving naturally. I don't mean running, I mean just walking as part of daily life. So as we think about getting moving, and as I thought about my aims, I tried to take a stab at calculating how much I wanted to run by the end of 2021. In my case, I want to run 1,000 kilometers. For me, it's running. For you, it might be walking. For you, it might be doing uh, dancing and so on. I have a name, and then I have some change ideas here, uh, both about the setup, the time of the day, for instance, and about how I'm going to go about facing into, testing my way into being able to run sustainably so that I achieve my aim. I also had some work-related aims here. One is to take a walking meeting every day. And for many of you who are on this session right now, you know, because I've been with you on some of my walking meetings uh, per day. And two stand-up meetings instead of sitting on a desk just to uh, meet standing up. These are straightforward. You're probably doing them. If you are, share them. If you are, share them. If you're not, consider them. The second uh, primary driver is about nurturing relationships. And for me, family has been an epicenter forever of energy and inspiration. And the secondary driver, for me, it's seen more of whom I love. Uh, my mother's 4,000 miles away from me. So I called her and I asked her when it would be appropriate to call her during the week. And I committed not just to calling her every Sunday, but to try to spend even two minutes, at least three times per week, with her. Um, with my two daughters, Emily and Sophia, I committed to at least one hour of one-to-one -one time, even if that one-to-one -one time was doing nothing but talking, uh, twice a week. When I talk about feeding the soul, I mean doing more of what you love. Some of the things that I love doing, family time, playing football, and cooking. In order to do more of what you love, though, I think we, as we did in the center in practice at the beginning of this conversation, need to think about doing less. Less is more about slowing down, about being present, being present. These are some of the change ideas that I tested or that I'm continuing to adopt in my life. Daily slow breathing, whether that's yoga, which was one of the big benefits for me during the pandemic, meditation, even if it's one minute, or just taking a, a, a one minute uh, breathing, deep breathing uh, break between meetings. Secondly, single tasking, committing to single tasking. Thirdly, I don't break the speed limit all the time, but I used to often, inadvertently and unintentionally. I'm committing to just not breaking the, the speed limit. Maybe leaving earlier. Uh, scheduling a break between meetings, scheduling do nothing time, journaling daily, whether that's gratitude or otherwise taking time just to sit down and write old school pen and paper. And lastly, for me, equity. I grew up in a paradoxical society full of inequities, and I've committed to both writing and mobilizing around equity. This is probably the best gift I've ever received over Christmas. Somebody gave me this uh, checking journal. Every morning, I have the opportunity to put three, three thoughts, so a morning check-in, to organize some of the key tasks, and then at night to check out. It's a discipline that, for me, in feeding the soul has been fundamental. The fourth, controlling technology, reducing screen time. And I'm just going to say it. Uh, the Center for Humane Technologies, uh, which is based in uh, California, where all the big tech companies are, has some brilliant ideas. And I stole some from them that I've adopted in my life. To me, it's about avoiding phone dependency. Just think about the amount of times that your hand is like this, just grabbing the phone and scrolling. Just, just think about how much time you're spending on that. So these are some of the change ideas that I'm suggesting that you consider. Limit the news intake to specific times. Reduce the attractiveness of the phone. You'd be surprised. If you treble click on the on button, the screen goes black and white. You'd be surprised about what that can do cognitively. Set screen time limits and phone downtime, which you can do on your menu so that you at least are aware of when you reach them and then can either say yes to continuing or no. Perhaps commit to a phone-free day per week. Perhaps commit to a phone-free day holiday per year. And definitely try to commit to putting the phone in bed. You don't need to read a story to it, but just put it away. Don't let the phone sleep with you in the room and try to give it a bedtime. And try not to turn it on first thing in the morning. The first thing you do is flick up. And then if you are so minded, try to delete some uh, unused apps and limit social media. 
I track my screen time and my pickup times is a pretty scary number to look at, actually. The first time I saw it, I could not believe what I was doing. And um, I'm learning, I'm learning. I have an aim, I have an aim uh, to reduce screen time to 100 minutes and pickups to 30 uh, daily uh, by December 31st, 2021. And the last one, which won't surprise you, is about eating and sleeping better. You know, at a very high level, eat and drink less rubbish. Uh, soft drinks, fast food, and so on. Just think about it, drinking more water and eating more plant-based plant foods. So what I've given you is, a, is an architecture, an invitation to a space of possibility founded upon the premise that it's fundamental, that the end of one, that it's each of you, takes care of yourself, that the end of many, that is all of us, work as a community to ensure that we're present in shaping the next normal, that we're pressing in shaping the next, the present in shaping the next normal. Words of wisdom, not many, but as you organize yourselves to do this, I would invite you to ring fence well-being time and to actually put it in your diary and to commit to at least one person to what you're doing. And as you move into testing, start small. Uh, do it joyfully. Uh, be willing to unlearn and then learn, improve, and repeat. This is a template. Uh, you're welcome to use it. I would appreciate that you share your learning with me and with others. Uh, in fact, perhaps we should get on the phone a month from now as a small community just to reflect on what you're doing. Um, and perhaps you can share some of your uh, ongoing and evolving ideas. So give yourself and those around you the gift of well-being. Be intentional. Share your experiences. Learn. Improve. And repeat. If you're curious and you want to learn more about some of the backdrop of some of the um, change ideas that I shared, there's a few books, there's a, there's a movie, there's a podcast, there's an article, and there's a check-in journal. Uh, let's draw individually and together. Uh, make your own tiramisu. Hashtag intentionally well. Uh, and thank you for being here, for being present, and for changing the way that we're going about our future.